All right, everybody. This is going to be a video on sort of the historical background, or as I say in the title here, historical context, St. Thomas Aquinas, the first author we're going to read. Um, there are some obstacles to making use of St. Thomas Aquinas's thought on ethics and politics um, nowadays, despite his undeniable importance to the history of thought. Uh, and the primary obstacle is that he lived in a social, religious, and political situation very different from that occupied by contemporary readers, by us. The problems he was responding to are by and large just not problems anymore. Uh, the social systems we now have to reckon with had not developed by his time. Like in his lifetime, this didn't exist, at least in most cases. Now, this obstacle is not insurmountable. But to get past it, you do have to know something about the historical context. The place to start is with the dates of his life. So Aquinas lived from 1225 to 1274. Uh, that's the when. Uh, the where is the countries we now call France and Italy, though Italy did not exist as a political unit at the time. And France only barely did. Um, Aquinas was a Dominican friar, and his status as such defined his life. Uh, and so the place to start is uh, in describing his context, the things that you know, are important to understand about the time he lived, is with a brief description of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, um, which is when Aquinas lived. Now, historians normally consider the Middle Ages to have been a period between the fall of the Western Roman Empire um, in the 400s AD to the upheavals in Europe in the 1400s and 1500s AD. Uh, so in the 1400s, the uh, Byzantine Empire finally falls. Uh, Columbus discovers the New World, or you know, at least discovers relative to what Europeans knew before that. Uh, in the 1500s, you get the Reformation, um, you get the Scientific Revolution starting, things like that. Uh, and here we have a couple of pictures of, on the left-hand side, the nobility, and on the right-hand side, the poor, poor peasants. Uh, in the Middle Ages, just to give you a little, little taste of uh, what the art tells us about that time period. Now, the thing that started the Middle Ages is the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, so what you see here is a map of the Roman Empire um, when it was divided in half. Basically, the decision was made that it was too big to be ruled uh, by one emperor, and so they split it into two parts. Uh, and originally they split each of those two parts into two subparts, uh, which is why there's sort of four uh, colored areas there. Um, the western side of this, so you see that you see that line going down the middle here, right? Uh, to the west of that line, all this stuff, this was the Western Roman Empire. And part of the reason I can color it out is it fell. Um, Technically, it fell in, I think, the 470s, but it was already basically nothing uh, and had been nothing of much importance for a couple decades by then. It fell in the 400s, and that led to a period of political chaos in which the only stable institution that ranged over all the old Roman territory was the Christian church. Um, Christianity had, of course, started, or, you know, around the ADBC split, right? That's when uh, Jesus was born. Uh, and you start getting um, uh, Christianity spreading fairly quickly after, after Christ's death. Um, and it doesn't become the official, lang or official uh, religion of the empire until, you know, actually close to around the time the empire got split in half. Um, but by the time the Western Roman Empire falls, it's the official religion of the empire. It's very uh, popular, especially in the East, not as popular in the West, although it would come to be. Um, but really, the Christian church, which hadn't split up yet into various parts, was the only real surviving institution, at least in the Western half of the old empire. Um, now, over time, the Pope in Rome came to occupy a special place of authority within the church. Uh, though competition between the Pope and the Patriarch in Constantinople uh, would lead to the Great Schism of 1054, which marked the separation between what we now know um, as the Catholic Church and the various Eastern Orthodox churches. 
so here you can see basically where that split is. Um, this is a map in 1054. Even in 1054, this was a little inaccurate because there were Christians outside of Europe and also n not everybody in Europe was Christianized yet. Um, there were still plenty of non-Christian pagans all over the, all over the place. Um, uh, but this is basically where the dividing line is uh, and was. Um, now, for several hundred years, it was basically only priests or other agents of the church. And this, this only goes for the Western part, right? This only goes for the Roman Catholic area. Um, but it was basically only agents of the church that were literate, educated, and in touch with anyone outside of the kingdom in which they lived. Um, these agents, like priests, bishops, archbishops, things like that, they gave the church a place in society that no contemporary institution matches. Um, for most people in Western Europe, in the early Middle Ages, uh, um, the local priest was the only stable source of authority they would ever know. Um, almost everyone they knew was a member of the same church as them. Uh, the only religious minority that was even sometimes partially tolerated were the Jews, and the Middle Ages were not a good time to be a Jew in Europe. Um, Pre-Christian pagans, like I mentioned before, was still, it was still present throughout the Middle Ages, but it was definitely on the decline. And soon all that would be left of it were the things we still have that are sort of the remainder of um, paganism, thing, like holidays like Halloween and Christmas, uh, Christmas has been repurposed to become a Christian holiday, but it was originally a pagan holiday called Saturnalia. Um, and sort of the symbolism that goes along with that, right? You probably already heard before that Christmas trees have nothing really to do with Christianity. It's an old German, um, uh, old German symbol and practice that goes back to before the Germans were Christianized. The church wielded power and wealth at this time that also would strike many modern people as peculiar. Um, uh, the church was incredibly powerful and incredibly wealthy in a way it's just not anymore. The Catholic church is still very wealthy. It's still very influential, but nothing like what it was uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, and there was a level of unanimity on religious and ethical questions that would also strike you as bizarre. Like when it came to beliefs about God, when it came to um, beliefs about right and wrong and your place in the universe and all those kinds of questions, uh, there wasn't actual unanimity, but it was much closer to unanimity than there is now, especially in the United States of America. Now, far more distant from people's lives and often less powerful and less wealthy than the church was the state. Now, it's a bit of a stretch to call any of the kingdoms of the early Middle Ages states, however. And the early Middle Ages is often called um, also the Dark Ages. Uh, a lot of historians don't like that, but it's, it's a really, really good name. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep using it. This is a map of Europe in, uh, I think, roughly like 600 AD, right? So you've got um, some, uh, you've got some, right, this here is the Eastern Roman Empire, which actually got a little bigger for a little while before it still slowly started to collapse. But what you have here, you might notice, is a bunch of sort of very fuzzy kingdoms that don't have precise borders. And they have borders that like don't even meet because like what's going on here is in this part of Germany, there were Saxons and where precisely the Saxons ruled depended on where the Saxons were at the time. And if you wanted to find Saxons, you just had to like walk in that direction and find some Saxons. And even these other kingdoms were barely states. Um, and the reason behind this is that the way political authority worked is that after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, different German warlords who were basically just in command of, you know, several thousand warriors and their families and things like that, who had basically done the work of destroying the West Western Roman Empire, they just took control of different parts of the empire. Um, the warlords were able to maintain, were unable rather, to maintain the political, legal, social, or social institutions of the Roman Empire or the Roman Empire's infrastructure. And so within a few hundred years, most of those institutions and most of that infrastructure was gone. Um, you know, they couldn't maintain the aqueducts, which brought fresh water to the cities. And partially as a result of that, the cities had shrunk to basically small villages. Uh, for example, Rome, which is basically, whoops, um, right about here, 
Uh, Rome had had more than a million people in it, uh, living there at the height of the empire. And by this time, the time this map shows, there's less than 100,000 people living in Rome. And that made it by far the largest city in Western Europe. Um, for comparison, London at this point was barely even a village. Um, it had fewer people living in it than Adrian, Michigan does today. Uh, Paris was barely anything. It had about 30,000 people living in it, right? So um, uh, the cities basically, with the exception of a few cities in Italy, just collapsed. Um, and it took, you know, a very, very long time for anybody to start living in cities in any appreciable number again. Uh, the road system, for the most part, broke down. Now, the Romans built really good roads, so they didn't, like, become completely unusable, but new roads stopped being built and the old ones stopped being maintained. Uh, Roman currency fell out of use. Um, it, you know, there's a skill to minting currency, and a lot of German kings just didn't have those skills. They didn't know how to make those kinds of things. Um, and uh, as a result, people turned to bartering. So instead of, you know, selling your wheat for gold and using that gold to buy chickens, you would try to find somebody who had chickens and needed wheat and do a trade, uh, which is not a very efficient way to do things. Um, outside the church, like I said, almost no one knew how to read. Uh, and in this situation, basically nothing like a modern state could exist. Uh, the king couldn't collect taxes because no one had any currency to pay him, right? And it's not like you could send all the wheat in France to the king in Paris. I mean, the king didn't live in Paris at that point, but whatever. Because, like, the wheat would all go bad by the time it got to him. So there's no way for the a central state to collect taxes, which is a pretty big deal. Um, the king couldn't have officials who would represent him throughout his kingdom because the officials, for the most part, wouldn't have known how to read and so couldn't be sent messages by the king telling them what to do. Uh, the king usually also was illiterate. Uh, in the 600s AD, most of the rulers of these kingdoms uh, could not read. Um, even where they could read, they definitely couldn't write. Um, and the kings wouldn't have been able to pay officials anyway. Uh, so there really wasn't any way to have the kind of bureaucracy um, that the modern state has. And without a bureaucracy, the state, the state can't really do anything. A bureaucracy is just the officials who work for the state who carry out the state's commands. Um, and so there weren't really states. The central government, such as it was, really just consisted of the people who lived in the king's house or who traveled around with the king from place to place. Um, kingdoms the size of England, though, could not, or England or France or Spain or Germany or any of these places, they couldn't really be ruled by a few dozen people, though. Um, and so what basically every Western European uh, state settled on was a system we have come to know as feudalism. And the way it worked is that the king would divide his kingdom up into parts and then put people in charge of each part. These people would swear loyalty to the, to the king, basically meaning they swore that if the king ever got into a fight, they would show up to fight on his side. In return, they got a, to run a part of the kingdom. But the same problem arose for those people. Uh, and those were usually dukes, right? So you have the royal family at the top and the next level down are dukes. And the dukes would have to break their duchies up into parts and give control of those duchies to their friends and allies. Um, and that would be, uh, as you can see here, the Mar Marquess. Um, and they would make the same deal with the dukes. If the duke had to go to war, the Marquess would go to war with them. But the Marquess would break up, you know, their area that they had control over into earldoms or counties ruled by earls or counts, who would then have viscounts underneath them, who would have barons beneath them, who would have knights, squires, and gentry between them. And below them um, were the peasants. Um, the peasants were at the bottom of the feudal hierarchy. And then you had this, uh, uh, you know, peasants reported to the local knight or squire, or other member of the gentry who reported to the baron, who reported to the viscount, who reported to the count, who reported to the marquess, who reported to the duke, who reported ultimately to the king. Or at least that was how it was supposed to work, to get around the fact that they didn't have a state apparatus. They just devolved authority onto these um uh, basically lieutenants. And over time, you know, what started out as a king telling his friend 
you know, if I'm King George and I've got a friend, Charles, and I say, Charles, you go run this part of my kingdom. And Charles says, yeah. And then, you know, when I die, my son puts Charles's son in charge of the same part of the kingdom. And eventually it becomes a hereditary thing. Um, now, peasants did not fight. All these other people, right, they fought. If you were a member of the nobility, and that's knights, squires, and gentry on up, your job was fighting. But peasants didn't fight. They grow food, or they grew food. Uh, and the reason why peasants is much larger here is almost everybody was a peasant. Um, there were very, very few people in these noble families. Sometimes you, uh, uh, you read histories or you hear fairy tales from uh, medieval, the medieval period, and it can give you a warped understanding of what most people's life was like, because usually those histories are told by members of the nobility or the fairy tales are about princesses or, you know, duchesses or things like that. Um, but 95% plus of people were peasants. Um, all they did was grow food, food that was used to keep them alive, but also to support all these nobles. Now, they grew food on land that usually did not belong to them but rather belonged to the local noble lord or potentially to the king. Um, but whether or not the peasants owned the land they worked on, and sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't, they still had to send part of what they grew to the noble lord who was in charge of them. Um, very often, especially early on, the peasants were also serfs, which meant they were bound to the land. They weren't allowed to leave the land they were born on. Um, and when, you know, one noble sold a plot of land to another noble, they were actually selling the people too. So serfs were kind of like slaves, except for they couldn't be separated from the land the way that, you know, like slavery in America, slave owners would sell slaves to other slave owners. And then the slaves would go from one plantation to another in medieval Europe. The way it worked was if you were a serf, you were bound to the land and you couldn't leave. You couldn't do anything else. If you were, you know, born a peasant, you were going to stay a peasant. Now, the role of churchmen in this society was kind of complicated. Um, most of them just served as simple parish priests who, you know, gave church services to the peasants. Uh, many of those parish priests had themselves been born into peasant families. Be entering the church was basically the only way for a peasant to get out of being a farmer. Um, at the upper echelons of the church would be people who served often as advisors to the kings or other high nobles. Um, at least once those kings and nobles settled down and stopped just, you know, being roving, murderous warlords. But what complicates things is that churchmen could also be noble lords, um, as in the churchmen would basically have one of these positions. You know, a, you could have a bishop who ruled something the size of a duchy, and so be equivalent to a duke or to a count or to a baron or something like that. Uh, meaning they would have peasants who worked land owned by not the particular individual who was the bishop, but owned by that bishopric. Right? Um, owned by the church and overseen by, you know, a local bishop. Um, and the deal there would be the same as for other nobles. Now, Often the bishop or abbot, um, who uh, was the noble lord, would not show up to fight for the king personally, although they did sometimes. There are bishops and abbots and priests who did engage in war during the Middle Ages. But even if they didn't show up personally, they would still have knights who answered to them, and they would send those knights to, um, to aid the king in a war. So, like, uh, going back to, like, dukes in the royal family, if a duke swore fealty to a king... When the duke showed up to support the king, so did everybody who served under that duke. So did all the marquises who served that duke, all the earls who served those marquises, all the viscounts who served those earls or counts, the barons who served the viscounts, and the knights who served the barons. All those people showed up. Now, for a few hundred years, things were, as this sort of feudal structure developed, things were pretty chaotic, uh, with kingdoms rising and falling quickly, and just sort of everything generally falling apart. Then we come, though, to Charlemagne, um, the famous, most famous king of the Franks. The uh, Franks were a Germanic tribe started in Northwest Europe, or who got their start in Northwest Europe. Uh, they had their capital here, Aachen, um, or at least they did after Charlemagne took over. 
And what Charlemagne did was he conquered a very, very large, uh, for the day, you know, nowhere near as large as the Roman Empire, but very large for the day, empire in Western and Central Europe. Now, Charlemagne's empire only lasted for a few generations before it broke up into three parts. Uh, and here you see with a little weird symbol in the middle to be a you know, watermark, basically to stop someone from using this the way I'm using it. Charlemagne's empire broke up into three parts, basically going to his three uh, grandchildren, I think grandchildren anyway, um, you had West Francia, East Francia, and uh, Lotharingia. Um, Lotharingia is, was the richest one, so Italy was the richest place in Western Europe at this point, but the only other place in competition for Italy for wealth was this area up here, which is where Aachen was, for example, the uh, Charlemagne's capital. Um, but in the Treaty of Verdun in 843, the Charlemagne's empire got broken up. Now, you don't need to know anything about these three different kingdoms because they don't really last long. Although, what basically happens is West Francia becomes France, East Francia becomes Germany, and the domain of Lothar gets swallowed up by Germany. Um, the kings of East Francia end up conquering um, almost all of that territory in Lotharingia, thus founding the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so this is the Holy Roman Empire around 1100 AD. As you can see, it's much larger than uh, the Kingdom of France, and it is far and away the most dominant, most powerful state, um, or at least political unit, in medieval Europe. Um, whoops. Uh, and it dominated the story of Middle Ages Europe. Uh, there were wars fought over who would be Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, there were wars fought between France and the Holy Roman Empire to determine which one of them would be the leading power in Western Christendom. Uh, there were wars fought between the Holy Roman Emperor and Italian nobles. So as you can see, the Holy Roman Empire rules this part of Italy. Um, but that was a very wealthy and powerful uh, area, and they didn't like being ruled by Germans. And there were very often wars between the German part of the Holy Roman Empire and the Italian part of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, because the Italian nobles and cities just didn't, they wanted to break away on their own. Um, but the most important struggle was between the Holy Roman Emperor, a series of Holy Roman Emperors, and the Popes. Nowadays, we think of the Pope as basically just a religious leader. You know, he leads the largest church in the world, so he's a very important religious leader, but he is just a religious leader. Uh, the Pope decides questions of doctrine, he appoints bishops and archbishops, things like that. In the Middle Ages, the Pope did all those things, but he was also a major political, military, and economic force. The Pope ruled central Italy directly as a monarch. So, um, basically, the Pope ruled a kingdom in central Italy that was basically this, right? directly, like that all just belonged to Rome and the Pope ruled Rome, not ruled in Rome, he actually ruled Rome, he was the, the person in charge of the city. Um, uh, the, in this role, by the way, the Pope was usually the one leading the Italians against the Holy Roman Emperor, the Pope ruled the largest sort of section of, uh, of Italy and would lead the, Ro the Italian nobles against the Holy Roman Emperor. So those, those fights, the fight between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor and between the Italian nobles and the Holy Roman Emperor, those got sort of wrapped up in each other. But an even bigger source of conflict um, was the Pope's claim to be able to decide who would be and would not be a bishop, priest, etc., anywhere in Western Christendom. And it might seem obvious to you that the Pope should be able to do this. I mean, the Pope's the head of the church, so the Pope should get to decide who the bishops are, right? Um, and this is, after all, something the Pope can do now when Popes have far less power and are far, far more widely respected and admired than they were uh, in the Middle Ages. Popes were more powerful, but also more often um, disrespected and attacked and things like that. Several Holy Roman Emperors killed Popes or imprisoned Popes, things like that. Um, but remember that thing I told you before, that bishops were very often large landowners and powerful nobles in their own right. 
And that meant that what the Pope was claiming the right to do was decide who would rule large parts of all these different kingdoms. France, England, um, the various uh, Spanish kingdoms, the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire. The Pope was basically saying the parts of your kingdom that belong to the church, I get to decide who runs those. And that was a problem for especially the Holy Roman Emperor. Even more, though, the Pope at the time claimed the right to be the, defi the final decision maker about who could serve as Holy Roman Emperor. As a result, for centuries, there was a conflict between the emperor and pope. And this conflict, which often um, was actually fought out as wars, but even when there wasn't active military combat going on related to this conflict, the political conflict was always there. Um, and it generated a lot of debate over the nature of law and appropriate authority. Was the pope, who was the representative of Christ on earth, and so the most reliable guide to the law of God, was the pope the highest authority? Or was the emperor, the chief military and political power in Europe, the highest authority? Um, in other words, who should you follow? Who should you obey? God or the state? Aquinas was living and writing in the immediate aftermath of this conflict. Um, and much of his thought on this issue was shaped by the enduring debates um, about the ultimate source of authority that had been going on for hundreds of years um, before he uh, started writing his books. Now, while there was a great deal of conflict over who had ultimate authority in the Middle Ages, that authority didn't actually do all that much. Um, the state did almost nothing for people in the Middle Ages. Uh, many people uh, living in the Middle Ages would not have dealt with the state at all. If you were a peasant, you didn't really interact with the king or any of the king's agents very often. The state had the function of waging war and enforcing the law and really not much else. And even much of the law enforcement and judicial activity of the state was actually handled by local nobles and or the church. Um, and basically all aid to the poor was handled through the church and its affiliated institutions. So the king didn't actually do all that much. Part of this had to do with how simple and unsophisticated most of society and the economy was. Um, well over 90% of the people, like I said, uh, in the Middle Ages did nothing but farm. They grew enough food to feed themselves after they turned over some portion of their crop to the local noble lord. Or if times got really tough, they didn't grow enough to feed themselves and they died. Um, the nobility, all those noble lords I talked about earlier, right? So these guys, um, they were often officially barred, legally barred, from engaging in any economic activities at all because they were supposed to be focused on military training, right? If your job is to show up to help the king fight his wars, the king doesn't want you farming, the king doesn't want you engaging in commerce, the king doesn't want you becoming a banker, right? And so with very few people, basically just the people who lived in cities, engaged in producing anything but food, there wasn't much in way of trade going on. Nowadays, people engage in many commercial transactions every day, but for many medieval peasants, there would be market days only infrequently. You would go to market maybe once a month, and you would trade what little extra food you had for maybe a set of clothes, or a pot to cook things in, or maybe a chair. Almost no one, even the few artisans in the cities who made finished goods worked for wages. So the most common way of earning a living nowadays, which is you have a boss who pays you to do work for a certain number of hours a day, almost no one lived that way in the Middle Ages, right? You made your own, you grew your own food or you made stuff that you traded for food. And even once there was currency around, there was, um, everybody basically worked for themselves or as a servant for someone else. There was no wage labor. Um, corporations didn't exist yet. Uh, banks existed, but only just barely, and they were nowhere near as wealthy or as sophisticated as they are today. And this relative lack of economic development and sophistication is an important thing to remember when thinking about what Aquinas has to say about economic justice and private property, because that's gonna be among the most surprising things to find uh, in the readings we're going to do. Like, I'm giving you a Catholic saint, and you're probably going to think you know what he's going to say, and in some cases you'll be right, but in some cases you'll be a little shocked. Um, 
Now, I do want to say, because I've just stressed all the ways that things were different, right, um, that while life was very different in Aquinas' time from how it is today, the processes that led to the development of modern society had, in a sense, already begun. Um, most historians call the period in which Aquinas lived the High Middle Ages. So here you can see um, the periods of the Middle Ages. You have the Early Middle Ages, often called the Dark Ages, the High Middle Ages, that's when Aquinas lived, um, and the Late Middle Ages. And like I said, from the year, around the year 1000, uh, which is a little more than 200 years before Aquinas was born, to the mid-1300s, the High Middle Ages, there was steady economic, intellectual, political, and social development throughout Europe. And the only reason this development stopped in the mid-1300s was because of the bubonic plague, or Black Death, which killed close to half to all, of all the people in Europe over the course of just around four years. Now, after that, after the bubonic plague, um, development restarted, and the late Middle Ages don't last very long before we get into the Renaissance, or what's sometimes called the modern period. And so if we ignore that interruption of the Black Death, a fairly big interruption, um, but uh, not one that was caused by society just falling apart on its own. It was caused by like an environmental catastrophe, a pandemic. Um, a pandemic, by the way, that was kind of actually tied to the economic development of Europe uh, because the bubonic plague came from uh, China. Uh, and it came from China across trade routes. Um, and uh, you know, before in the early Middle Ages, China wasn't sending any goods to Europe because Europe had nothing worth sending back. They couldn't trade with China because they didn't have anything anyone in China wanted. Um, uh, but if we put that development to one side, right, if we take out the sort of blip of the bubonic plague, what we can see is that um, Aquinas was alive around the beginning of a thousand year period of growth and development in Europe that leads all the way up to today. That includes not just Europe, but countries that Europe founded on other continents, right, like the United States. Um, but because he was at the beginning, that means he lived before the development of the modern state, before the development of modern capitalist economies, um, before much of any kind of cultural religious pluralism. And so he lived in a very different time than ours. And you just have to keep that in mind when you're reading him. You know, How do you take the fundamental insights he has, fundamental insights that are still sort of the guiding force behind um, a lot of contemporary thought, especially, you know, among Catholics. Um, how do you take those fundamental insights and apply them to a modern age, an age very different than the age in which Aquinas lived?